Sabrina Johal. Yes. And you're director for business development. That's right. At General Atomics. Yes. Okay. So let's talk about where you grew up. You're from Montana? I grew up in Billings, Montana. And I grew up in an environment where there was a lot of farming and ranching in the area. There wasn't a lot of science and technology or engineering. And so when I thought of a profession as a child, I really just knew pediatrician or a doctor. Yeah. And so, but... Is that what your parents did? Pediatrician or a doctor? No. So my parents, uh, when I was real young, they had a used car lot. And so they sold used cars. Cool. And then my mom went back and qualified to be a realtor. And so she started the real estate business. And that's still what she's doing. And she has a lot of passion for it. And she loves it. Yeah. And and my dad went into mortgage banking for a little bit of time and now they uh, buy homes and fix them up and sell them. Okay. So they work together now. They work together. Very and cute. when you look at people in um, Billings, most of them have their own businesses and okay. it is in a high income area. Um, but the interesting thing about it is for me at least my home backed into a forest. Oh, nice. And so there were very few physical boundaries. Yeah. So we went out and we had a lot of exploratory nature activities that we were able to do. And I really value that. That's one of the things I think about now that I'm in San Diego is how <laughs> my children are going to be able to do that. Yeah. But it was relatively secluded from, you know, the geopolitical stage or mm-hmm. even diversity in other cultures. So I did not fly on an airplane. And I didn't even see the ocean until I graduated from high school. No I went way. away to college. That's crazy. So why, so, I mean, if you hadn't had any of those experiences, you said you went away to college, where did you decide to go and why? Uh, My brother was a year older than me in school and he got a wrestling scholarship to Stanford. Cool. And so I applied to two schools and figured if I get into one of them, I'll go. You know, I, I was the one that went into an SAT or the ACT and just sat down and took it. I didn't do any studying, didn't really know anything about studying for these exams. And I hear really? about it all the time now. And it's so funny to me because I went in, I took the exam and, you know, applied to school. So I ended up yeah. going to Santa Clara University. So did the school that you went to, the high school, they just didn't have a big focus on pushing kids through college? Sorry. It was a Catholic <laughs> school. And yeah. um, there were 80 kids in my graduating class. And I just, I don't recall our, our advisor at the time was yeah. a, was a nun. And so she had, you know, things that she was uh, promoting. So I actually went to Santa Clara and I had applied it to Stanford because of the Jesuit Catholic focus. So then you go to Santa Clara University. What do you study? So when I was at Santa Clara, I, I think because of the influence of having doctors as one of the only professions I knew of. And I really didn't do any internships or have any yeah. interaction with industry at the point where I was going to school. I was going, I was in pre-med. And so I did physics, biology, and chemistry. Uh-huh. And um, my senior year, I was able to travel abroad to the University of London. And that oh. was really the first time that I started growing this uh, passion and patriot- patriotism for our country. Huh. We're seeing how great the United States is and really realizing, you know, because from a small town in Montana, you have a very limited view of what the world is and being able to study outside really grew awareness for me. Mm. And um, so it was my senior year actually in college. Of college. After getting all of my loans, having all my loans uh, that I was applying to medical schools and I started being, and I started being recruited by an elite program in the Navy. Uh, the Navy Nuclear Power Program. Yeah. And that changed my life, put it on a completely different trajectory that I ever thought that I would would ever pursue. Yeah. So what do you mean by recruiting? Was this like a student fair at Santa Clara? It was not. They actually contacted me directly. Wow. And um, I was able to meet with a recruiter. I still remember to this day, there's this big fountain on campus at Santa Clara. So he and I met up there and for the next four or five months, I talked with him every week. Wow. And because there were a lot of oral exams and written exams, 
that you were were required to pass prior to getting an invitation to naval reactors in Washington, D.C. Were you scared? I feel like I would be kind of freaked out by that. I was not scared at all. I felt like school wasn't that challenging for me. Oh, really? And I was getting, even pre med, it wasn't. I just didn't feel like it was. And I wanted a challenge and I yeah. wanted to see. I felt like there was something more that I should be doing. Yeah. And oh boy, yeah. did I get the challenge that I was looking yeah, for? Yeah. Tell me about it. What was, what was, you know, one of like the most challenging things you think you did in the Navy? Well, so it was always this progression of events because um, your perspective changes a little bit every time you, you get more exposure into something. Yeah. Um, So I received the invitation to go out to Naval reactors in DC and I interviewed with three of the scientists there. Mm -hmm. And if they give you a passing score, then you interview with the Admiral, the nuclear Navy, a four star Admiral. um, Were any of these people women? They were not women. Okay. And When I interviewed with the Admiral, his name was Admiral Skip Bowman at the time. He was the third successor to Admiral Hyman G. Rickover. And I think something that gets lost a little bit in um, the place we are today in terms of developing nuclear technologies is understanding what Admiral Rickover was able to accomplish Mm -hmm. back in the 40s and the 50s to really start the nuclear industry within the United States. So he was born in 1900. He went to the U.S. Naval Academy, 19, graduated in 1920. And he was essentially slated for early retirement in mm-hmm. about the early 19 or mid 1940s after World War II. And for all intents and purposes, he probably would have been in the retirement track. But he applied to a program uh, at Oak Ridge, Tennessee, where they were looking at all the technology from the Manhattan Project mm-hmm. and seeing how they can now apply it to nuclear reactors for electricity generating purposes. Mm. And so mm-hmm. he applied and he was let into the program. And he came away from that saying, we need to do this in the United States submarine force today. Yeah. You know, at the time they were all diesel powered. The submarines were diesel powered. So diesels are air breathing machines. They couldn't submerge for longer than 15 or 20 miles, and they only went 8 to 10 knots. Right. If you could put a nuclear nuclear power plant on board a submarine, Mm -hmm. can you imagine the implication? Right. Well, at the time, nobody could. Yeah. But he was able to work with Congress, work with the Atomic Energy Commission, which was the, the predecessor to the NRC, and work with Department of Defense to actually get this in place. So up to that time... All that the American public knew of for nuclear technology was fat man and little boy weapons purposes. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it was right around the time of Adams for Peace when President Eisenhower gave started this huge initiative of bringing peaceful purposes to nuclear power, Mm -hmm. really because he knew if the United States didn't do it, that it would promulgate all these other bad activities on the global stage. Yeah. And so that was around 1953 that they launched the program. And in 1955, Rickover launched the USS Nautilus, which was the first first. nuclear submarine. Yeah. It was built by General Dynamics. And all anti-submarine doctrine up to that point was considered obsolete because it was just amazing what it could actually do, right? Could go faster, could be submerged for longer distances. And so... By the time I went through this program with interviewing with three scientists and then interviewing with Admiral Bowman, it was it was really it was interesting because it was a time honored tradition of the Admiral of the Nuclear Navy interviewing every officer that was accepted into the program. Right. You don't see it's that very, in other corporations. Right. It's so valuable that they gave you your time. It is their time like that. It is extremely valuable yeah. because you know, Rick over started it because he knew one accident, one thing that went wrong mm-hmm. would put the entire program at risk. Yeah. And so when I met with Bowman, I knew nothing about military operations. Yeah. So how do you prepare to meet with him? I just, I went in there um, just prior to meeting with him. There was another officer that told me what to say, you know, always say, yeah, he sir, you. <laughs> <laughs> I 
all yeah. these things. Because, you know, I was just a scrappy civilian at the time, <laughs> getting ready to meet a four-star admiral. Because you, you are in the Navy at this point? Or this I'm not. Or part of the recruitment? It was part, this of, the part of the process to be accepted into the program. Amazing. And I had never known anybody who was in the military. Yeah. No one. I'll, I have, I have a, an uncle who was in Vietnam War who doesn't talk about it. Yeah. That was it. I didn't know anything about military and operations. And they have very specific etiquette and you very know, specific a, a background knowledge that's helpful to know before meeting with the admiral. Yes. <laughs> and so I just went in and, you know, at the end, he, ex- he congratulated me and accepted me into the program. And in my I, mind... In the interview. In the interview. At the end of the interview, he said, okay, you're in? Yes. Wow. Yes. It's great. Yeah. And so... To me, I didn't really know. I didn't say, yes, I'm going to be doing this. Okay. I kind of started the process. Yeah. And it was so lengthy and so tedious that I figured if they accept me at the end, I'm going to do it. Yeah. And so (laughs) I tell my parents and they they just are, what's she off about? I mean, they don't, you know, how is she going to be doing a military career when, you know, we know nothing about it? Did your parents, were they, you know, communicating with you throughout the four months that they were actively recruiting you? Or was it like at the end, you're just like, hey, parents. I talked to them very frequently. So okay. They knew everything that was happening. But yeah. the funniest thing is, I didn't know I was going to be on a ship. Yeah. I thought I was going to be stashed away somewhere in the United States and, you know, a bunker. Like in an office. Running or... physics codes. Yeah. Somewhere secret. I didn't know I was going to be on a ship. Why do you say you thought that you would be running physics code when you're from a medical background? Well, because they accepted me because of my physics. Okay. So they had... The physics and the chemistry. Yeah. So you're going in with the idea of focusing on physics. And I guess that appealed to you because you said school was pretty easy for you. So Right. And I wanted something different. Yeah. So three months later or so, I went to officer candidate school. And this is where the military teaches officers the etiquette that you need to be an officer. And, yeah. and um, the third day I was there, they shaved my head. So they took oh, a no. razor to my head and they shaved it. And the recruiter told me that they wouldn't do that as long <laughs> as I cut really? my hair <laughs> above my shoulder. So I went in with this nice, cute bob. Yeah. Um, came out with the shaved head. At the time, it did not bother me because I had so many other things I was worried about. Right. You know, but but the hard, th- I will say the hard thing with that is now when you're on a ship, you have a very specific way you have to wear your hair. Yeah. And I don't know if you've ever chopped your hair off and then tried to grow it out. It's, I have not. It's impossible to put it back into these buns or whatever, right. you know, these it's all, things are yeah. that are required. Um, and then that was also... Around the same time, I found out I was going to be spending the next six years of my life on a ship. Six years was six the years. commitment? Yes. On a ship? Yes. And had you ever, you know, been on a ship for like more than a day before? Oh, no. <laughs> Maybe for terrifying. 30 minutes. I didn't. I know. would be crying at this point in time. <laughs> I was pretty, I was, I was pretty devastated, I think. But also, yeah. you just don't know what you don't know. Right. And so I, I didn't know what I was getting into. And so by the time I graduated OCS, um, officer, officer candidate school in Pensacola, Florida. Oh, in Pensacola. In Pensacola. But I only, saw, place. I only saw it like four times <laughs> in three months. The other interesting thing that happened to me on board was it was about two days after I qualified as officer of the deck. That I was in a ship. The first time or the second time? So you only qualify once. So, okay. So this was when it was mostly men. Yep. And you were there for a bit. Okay. Yep. So still my first deployment. Just qualified as officer of the deck. And I was in a collision with an Iranian tug. Oh, no. And so. How do you deal with that? Thankfully, I was. Uh, I did not have responsibility for the ship because the captain had come up. Okay. And said, I have the con. I am responsible. Yeah. And I was there. Observe. Well, he then put me in the conning position. So he was giving me orders. And so imagine three days later, we're off the coast of Iraq. There's an Iranian tug that was doing something mischievous. And mm-hmm. the UN told us to go board them because that's what we would do. We would bring boarding team on and they would look for these 
items that they weren't supposed to have. So they literally go on their ship yes. and look through it. Yep, we would send boarding teams on board their ship. Wow. And so we were trying to chase them down, and they just turned into us, and they punched a 10-foot hole in the side of our ship. Oh, my gosh. And we went to battle stations right away because we started taking on water. Yeah. And there was a lot of weapons of mass destruction talk at that point, so we didn't know what they had on board, if they were going to um, detonate something and blow us up. And... uh. The military has this practice on board ships where if something bad happens, you go to battle stations, Mm. which means that Mm -hmm. you now, you know, the person who's best at firing tomahawks goes and and sits at the tomahawk station. Person who's best at driving the ship goes up and drives the ship. Person that's best at navigating. Mm -hmm. And I was the tomahawk strike warfare officer, so I was supposed to go man tomahawks, which makes no sense. Because it wasn't. Because it it was a collision. Yeah. So the captain said, Ensign Zimmer, you stay here. You have the deck. I'm mm-hmm. going downstairs Wonderful. to combat, to file reports. Yeah. And everyone else on my team was replaced. Yeah. Because they, the battle stations started coming on. And I lost, everybody else lost all sense of awareness. Hmm. From of what the was shock, happening. Be, the, all it the was, change. and It was two in the morning. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> the Iranian tug was sitting oh. right next to us. Yeah. They're all waking up. You know, the battle station sirens are going, the red lights bleeping, blaring. Yeah. Everybody runs up. And I'm the only one with situational awareness of what's happening. So to me, that it just seems like that's not a very effective practice for you right. know, certain things. It's not so, very healthy to put that pressure on one person. Either. Well, or just to lose the complete sense of situational awareness. Because now you have a conning officer, you have a nav- you know, the navigator runs up in his boxer shorts. <laughs> <laughs> so how's he? You know, it was, it yeah. Was, so then um, that was Operation Enduring Freedom, and you're supposed to go out for six months, and then you come back, and you know another ship is out there. Mm-hmm. But this was the one year anniversary of September 11th, mm. and so we were actually on our way home. We were in Australia. I had shipped all of my stuff off because I was going to nuclear power school. Mm-hmm. And um, the captain called me to a stateroom and said that the admiral of the fleet had just called and were getting turned around to go back to the Gulf. Oh, no. To fire Tomahawk missiles. No. This was the one-year anniversary of... Yeah. And he said, and I want you there. You're my Tomahawk strike officer. And how'd you feel? And I said, well, I had felt is- very isolated for mm-hmm. that entire six months because of the gender issues. And I said yeah. to him... I've shipped all my stuff off. I've already trained my replacement. The surface training manual mm-hmm. calls for three people who are trained. We have three people on board. I think it's better for the Navy for me to continue on my path. Yeah. And he said, I want you to leave and think about it and then come back and tell me how you really feel. <laughs> and, and so what happened? So I left and I was freaking out because yeah. I was like, I, you know, really don't feel like I could stay longer. Right. And so I went back and I told him the same thing. And to his credit, he let me off in Australia. Okay. So he let me off in Australia. They turned around. They went back. They fired all their cruise missiles. They crossed that cruise missiles from our sister ship and fired those. And they were there for 10 months. Well, it's just a really long time. So you <laughs> made a good choice then not to go? Well, and there are certain choices about firing missiles and weapons. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't have to make it on that day. But those are choices, obviously, that people in the military have to make. And so I went off to nuclear power school and prototype school and um, went on the USS Carl Vinson. Much friendlier environment. Yeah. 20% women. Why do you think it was such a different environment? I think because women were integrated much sooner. Yeah. And an aircraft carrier is amazing. It's 5,000 people. 3,000 that are dedicated. In to one um, aircraft? On one ship. Ship. So it's this large ship. Uh-huh. And it can carry up to 70 aircraft. 70 aircraft? 5,000 people. 
That's amazing. 3,000 are part of ship's company dedicated to operating the ship and functions, and 2,000 are the air wing that fly the aircraft. And everything on board that ship that has to do with power or energy, except Mm -hmm. for the jet fuel for the aircraft, comes from the uranium fissioning in the reactor core. Mm. So on an aircraft carrier, you have two, two reactors. And when the uranium fissions, it creates heat. And there's a primary coolant system that's pressurized that flows through and picks up the heat. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't turn to steam because it's pressurized. Mm -hmm. Then it goes into a steam generator and through uh, cross-current heat flow, the secondary system that's not pressurized picks up heat and turns into steam. And that steam then pushes the blades to get the propeller to move Mm -hmm. to make the ship go through the water. Yeah. Pushes the blades on the ship service turbine generator to create electricity. It's the heat that sucks up seawater and distills it because that's what you okay. drink. Okay, so it desalinated your drinking water. Yep. It's amazing. It's multi-purpose. Um, and it goes up into these, um, these uh, catapult chambers, vent system, that actually takes the steam and fires the aircraft off the deck. So wow. Everything. Everything well. comes from nuclear power. Isn't that amazing? It is amazing. And how much did you know about nuclear power? This was after you went to... The school for it i went to so the the training program is um you do six months of in school training mm-hmm. which means that you're book studying from 7 a.m to 4 p.m and what is the focus on you have to know reactor physics reactor dynamics um it's chemistry associated with primaries it is a well it is a lot and <laughs> it's essentially a master's degree yeah. in the course of a year. So the first six months is book learning. Okay. And, and so then... you go into this facility. Mm-hmm. Everything is very um, is controlled, so top secret. And from, from seven to four, you learn. Mm-hmm. But you study through the night, essentially. Yeah. So I would arrive at 5 a.m. and I'd leave around 10 p.m., 10, 30 p.m. Oh, my gosh. But I took Saturdays off. Good for you. I needed to, which is a <laughs> lot. I mean, most people are there seven days a week. Yeah. And the, the reason why is because you have an exam every Friday hmm. and your written. scores are posted, written. They post your scores Publicly. the following Monday for everybody to see. It's part of, the, part of the training. It's terrible. And if you don't <laughs> pass, if you don't get high enough marks, they put you on mandatory study hours, Mando hours. What does that even mean? It's like, like means- extra from your seven to four mandatory so you clock in and you clock out and you have to meet the 50 hours extra or whatever it is until you pass the exams that sounds like a really cutthroat environment it's very cutthroat and a lot of people um or some people won't pass it their first time through so they don't they don't get a quit yeah you know they go back right and they do it over and they do it over yeah and so and then after that initial six months you go away to they call it prototype school and based on how you ranked in power school they set you up in a position of prototype school so i went to power school at charleston south carolina and i scored well enough to pick um, upstate new york Mm -hmm. and i was in charge of the group that went up there with me as part of the class leader which i enjoyed and then that that particular institute it was in boston spa um, new york and it had a submarine reactor as a real reactor with a cruiser, which is a ship, hmm. engine room. And so you would go and you would be on 12-hour shifts and you'd operate it. And that was for the six reactor. months. You'd yeah, operate the re- reactor for a 12-hour shift. Mm-hmm. Were they overnight? Yes. Oh, yeah. Because that's probably what you would be likely doing once you're on the that's ship, right. once you're deployed. It was shift work. So you would, you, would, um, you would do one 12-hour shift for seven days and then you bump it four hours into another 12-hour shift, and then you'd bump it four hours. Was it ever um, a little frightening for you to operate the reactor? It wasn't frightening in the sense of for my physical safety. Mm -hmm. It was frightening maybe in the sense that they would run casualty drills. And Mm -hmm. so as the officer, you would be sort of stepped back from the rest of the team, and they would have an inspector come in. And they would say, okay, number one reactor scram or lost coolant casually. Mm-hmm. And you were supposed to have memorized all of the procedures associated with 
every type of accident and know exactly where to pull the procedure from. Mm -hmm. And you pull it and you lead the team through step by step until the reactor plants recovered. Yeah. And so that was that. And so all of this year of training happened prior to um, going on the aircraft carrier on Carl Vinson. And then how long were you on that one? For? And then I was on there for two years. And you helped operate the reactor. I did. For those two years. Yes. So at this point in time, how do you feel about nuclear power? Are you like amazed by it or are you, you know, annoyed because you've spent so much time studying it? <laughs> <laughs> well, so what I realized was how important nuclear power and nuclear energy are to national security. Yeah. And that's one of my main passions right now. And it's why I'm so concerned about the state of the commercial fleet today. Yeah. So let's talk about that. Um, why are you concerned about it? Um, so after leaving the Navy, I left the Navy in 2006 and I went to General Atomics. And General Atomics has an active fission program where we had... Uh, back in the 1950s, again, during Atoms for Peace, mm -hmm. we had established a technology called TRIGA, Training Research Isotopes General Atomics, and then built two gas reactors mm -hmm. in the 60s and 70s. So instead of being cooled by water, they were cooled by helium gas. And then when I started General Atomics in 2006, around 2008 timeframe, our owner, who's very visionary, General Atomics is a privately held company, mm -hmm. um, challenged us to come up with a reactor that was cost effective because reactors at that point in time were losing marketplace. Mm -hmm. and, because they're so expensive to build. Well, so most of the fleet today was built back in the 70s and the 80s. Mm -hmm. And those capital costs are all written off. Okay. But they're not competing today on just the fuel and operating costs. And mm -hmm. when, you, when you look at revenue generation in a nuclear plant, it's competing on the market basis. Mm -hmm. And markets are short-sighted. Yeah. They don't necessarily value the other aspects of nuclear energy that are so important for clean energy, for national security. And what you see is you have a low price of natural gas at $2 or $3 an MMBTU, driving nuke plants out, as well mm -hmm. as subsidies for wind. Yeah. And so our nuke plants are not competing, and a lot of them are shutting down early. And it's a great travesty to me. How do you think that could be solved, though? How do you get people to change the way that they price or that they value nuclear? I think that it has to happen from a state and a federal level at this point mm -hmm. where they start looking at, because of all of these other benefits of nuclear, to start inserting something in the marketplace that makes them so that they're going to be competitive. So I think then that, you know, wouldn't people who are in the Navy be really inclined to push government to go in that direction? I think that, um, so what I see from people in the Navy, like me, they've seen the benefits of nuclear energy for national security. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of my um, main concerns is that if the United States doesn't have a civilian reactor fleet, we don't have leadership abroad either. Mm -hmm. And you see the Chinese and the Russians making these engagements with developing countries or countries that don't have nuclear of their own. Right. And so they're building those plants in country. That's now a hundred year engagement between providing the fuel, the technology, potentially operating the plant. You know, these plants can last up to 60 years. Mm -hmm. And so, and we've seen it recently with China in terms of Ukraine and Turkey, where they're providing an electricity source, yet when things start happening on the geopolitical stage, they pull back on that and they yeah. use that as leverage in the right. negotiation. Mm -hmm. And so my concern is, how is the United States going to enter that picture? And we're not there. Not at we're all. We're not there at all. <laughs> How yeah. are we going to, if we don't have our own domestic fleet and our own 
advanced reactor technology development. Mm -hmm. When you look at Russia and China, they're all state corporations. They're all backed by the government. Yeah. When you look at the United States, we have funding for advanced reactor technologies, Mm -hmm. but it's a fixed amount of funding and it's peanut buttered out amongst 75 different technologies or 75 different concepts to go from a conceptual design to a commercial design in an advanced reactor is $4 billion. Mm -hmm. There isn't any company that's going to bet their balance sheet on one reactor design. Right. And so if the United States... That they have probably have never seen tested before. Absolutely. Right. They have not tested and we don't have the means to test. And so when we start thinking about building testing facilities inside the United States... If you don't have one design or two designs, you have to then have the facilities that can test all these multiple, mm-hmm. you know, six, seven, whatever different types of designs, which also is an increased burden. Yeah. And Isn't the, like, wouldn't the testing facility have to be built by the government? Isn't there some caveat there? Is. Out there? Well, there, so the, the U.S. government right now is backing a testing facility in Idaho. Mm-hmm. And they're going through looking at what the, the design of this facility look like. Mm-hmm. And it has to be a bigger issue than it normally would be because there are all these multiple types of reactors that they have to be able to to meet the the needs and the requirements for. So you're kind of on the side of let's just pick one and go with it and push that one out to the commercial landscape quickly. So if you look at and people say, well, the United States has has been a leader in this area. Why can't we continue to be a leader? Mm -hmm. Go back to the 1950s and look at what Admiral Hyman G. Rickover did. Because he, so he started the submarine program, USS Nautilus launched in 1955, but he was also in charge of shipping port in Pennsylvania, which Mm -hmm. was the first commercial civilian reactor for electricity. And that was 1957. And what he did is he had one design, a pressurized water reactor led by Westinghouse, Mm -hmm. and he had a backup, a sodium cooled reactor by GE. Two. He had two. Yeah. They didn't fund 75 (laughs) and see which of the 75 are going to make it. Right. Much more manageable, too. Yeah. So (laughs) so what we need today is we need to figure out which designs we want to go with, and Mm -hmm. we need a visionary. We need somebody like Admiral Rickover who can work with Congress, the AEC, which is the NRC at this point in time. Mm -hmm. And then he was able to work with the Department of Defense as well. So we can really start having that conversation with multiple different stakeholders, making sure that they're all talking together, Mm -hmm. but also having accountability. You need somebody to have accountability in order to get this, in order to make progress in this. And I think until we do that, we are going to be, we're going to continue to not, we haven't pushed a needle Mm -hmm. on any one design. New Scale is doing a great job at at, um, doing what they can. Mm -hmm. But the only really, I think, light at the end of the tunnel, and I hope that that this works, is that the Department of Defense is thinking about jumping back in. Mm -hmm. And so they've developed now, um, they put out a request for solutions for a micro reactor program. Mm -hmm. A micro reactor is one to 10 megawatts, not a thousand megawatts like you see on the grid today. Right. And they have it for a specific purpose. They want to support their troops abroad as well as support infrastructure within the domestic installations. Yeah. And abroad in remote locations. Right. Where it's so, to get power. so when you think of protecting our troops and they're on foreign lands and they have to have some sort of electricity source. Right now, you know, we are bringing in diesel fuel, bringing in fuel to operate the critical infrastructure on site. So having a nuclear reactor plant there is a perfect idea because it isolates it now. And it's own little island off the grid, protects our people, Mm -hmm. protects the people that we're bringing the fuel on site. Yeah. You can bring more fuel with less volume, right? So a reactor plant is much more power dense than a fossil fuel type plant Mm -hmm. and the reactor core can operate for longer periods of time without requiring refueling. So to me, it's kind of a no brainer (laughs) because what price do you put on a life? Right. And so people who are giving their lives for yours. Right. Which is another one of my um, things, but 
So if the Department of Defense can get a microreactor program and actually get a design going, and they fully plan on down selecting, they're not worried. Down selecting, like taking seventy five to two. Picking, yeah, yes, <laughs> picking a winner. They're not worried about you know this perception. I think more on the civilian side where the government doesn't want to be in a place of picking winners and losers. Is it because you think that they are more incentivized to push it out quicker? So, you know, they're just willing to. I don't know. I don't know why. I don't know why the civilian side is taking that stance on yeah. not picking winners and losers. I'm sure there's a reason, um, but. The DOD is not concerned about that. They realize if they're going to get a product, and they want that product in three to five years, right. that they need to down select, that they can't just peanut butter out the funding. Yeah. And so if the DOD now can get another domestic program going within the United States and really prove that we can implement a new technology, I think that can have um, ramifications for sure in the civilian side in terms of factory production. A mm-hmm. lot of these advanced reactors are smaller, so they could potentially be built in a factory. Well, if you have a one to 10 megawatt and you're punching them out, you can learn a lot in terms of, you know, what's the assembly line look like? What's the manufacturing? How to optimize that process exactly. quickly. Exactly. Yeah. So what would it take for the DOD to actually get a program like this approved? So they right now they're in an open uh, procurement phase. They put out a request for solutions a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. The responses are due on Monday. Oh, my gosh. That's exciting. It is exciting. And phase one will be 12 months. At the end of phase one, they'll be down selecting or they'll be picking winners. Yeah. So I think it's a really exciting program. And I can't wait to see where it goes. Yeah. I hope it, you know, is successful because I totally agree with you. Like, I'm terrified of China and Russia beating us to the race of being a supplier of power for these other countries um, don't want to end up on the other side where China and Russia are suppliers. No. And, and yeah. their, their, um, their safety regulations are different, different than the United States. The United States yeah. has a gold standard. And so, you know, any engagement that we can have then yeah. promulgates that same safety forward to right. these developing nations, which is really important. It's kind of interesting to me talking to you about, you know, how it seems like the Navy is just so advanced in the nuclear space. Mm -hmm. And you guys have must have so many experts, you know, from all the hard training that you guys have done Mm -hmm. um, and studying. But then it's almost like it's hidden from, you know, the rest of the world. I don't think a lot of people know. It is interesting. Even so I work at General Atomics now. I don't know of any other Navy nukes that I'm working with. Except yeah. one person who's uh-huh. on my team. I hired him a couple of years ago, and he's phenomenal. Yeah. He's the only other one I can think of. Really? But it's funny when you start looking at, like, Jimmy Carter was a Navy nuke. Yeah? I uh, never knew that. Paul DeBar is a Navy nuke in the Department of Energy right now. You know, you you find these people that, that were in that area, but they yeah. seem to, they don't stick strictly to, although I will say this, the, the civilian nuclear industry running the plants today Mm -hmm. that's where people go yeah when they leave the navy Mm -hmm. and that's another reason why having a civilian side is so important for national security because why would anyone go into the nuclear navy if they didn't have somewhere to come out on the other end right it's a big training pipeline yeah i mean so wouldn't wouldn't that be a huge incentive for the u.s government to back it then you know i feel like Something that creates jobs is always like a no-brainer. Well, so, and this might get a little philosophical, okay. but <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of reasons why we should be looking at nuclear technologies. Yeah. If you think about, from a physics basis, getting inside the nucleus of an atom mm-hmm. versus getting the chemical energy from the electrons that are orbiting around the atom. Mm-hmm. When, and that's what fossil fuels are, the electrons orbiting around the atom and the bonds that they make with other atoms. Yeah. The power that you can get from inside the nucleus versus the electrons on the outside is a million times higher. Yeah, it's amazing. So when you start looking at population growth, mm-hmm. coupled with the fact that we have some, something like 7.5 billion people in the world today and 1.1 billion of those people don't have access to electricity, 
And we know that power equals power or electricity equals prosperity. Yeah. So how do we energize those populations, getting them the electricity that they need, plus meet a growing population need? You have to get down into power density. You mm-hmm. have to reach the nucleus of the atom. That's why General Atomics is working in fission and in fusion, yeah. because both of those do that. So we work in two types of fusion. One is magnetic fusion energy, which is essentially bringing the power of the stars to Earth. Do you want to go through the difference between fission and fusion? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, <laughs> so fission is what we know of nuclear energy today. It's when you, you split an at- atom into two or you fissure it. Mm-hmm. Fusion is taking two atoms and making them into one. So in uh, magnetic fusion energy, you're taking isotopes of hydrogen, which is the lightest element on Earth, and you're combining it into helium. Mm-hmm. And then you have an energetic neutron that comes off. And that energe- the energy from that neutron is what you then can put into a cycle to create electricity. Okay. So what General Atomics does, <clears throat> and where most of the domestic fusion program for the United States has done, is... They look at, um, it's called a tokamak. It's a Russian acronym. Okay. Um, but it's essentially a donut that's a vacuum chamber. Huh. And they put magnets around the outside and through the middle of the vacuum chamber. Okay. And when you insert these isotopes of hydrogen, an isotope is when you have a different number of neutrons than something else, but you have the same number of protons. So hydrogen always has one proton. So when you inject these um, isotopes of hydrogen inside this donut vacuum chamber, they make it become a plasma. So they strip off mm. the electrons, which then gives it a charge. And because it has a charge, the magnets that surround the facility can control it. Because as we know, right, opposites they can attract it. and magnets can control charged particles. Yeah. And so most of the domestic fusion program has gone to funding that technology. General Atomics has been doing that since the 1960s. We have the, mm-hmm. uh, the largest operating fusion facility in the United States on site in San Diego. If you want to come see it. I would love, love for you to. to come see it. Yes, absolutely. And so so they've been, that designs from the mid 1980s and it's a user facility. So over 100 institutions from around the world Mm -hmm. travel to San Diego to run their physics codes. And they have a control room and they run shots, just like you could could imagine. And so when they started looking at what are we going to do for that next device? This was in 1985 where Gorbachev talked to President Reagan Mm -hmm. and said we should have a global fusion science experiment. A global fusion facility that's going to take fusion that step further. Yeah. And so they developed ITER, I-T-E-R, which is um, the way in Latin. And it's being built right now in Cotterash, France. And there are seven members, 35 nations, Mm -hmm. who are all pooling our money together to see this experiment through. Yeah. And it reached. Is this government money? It is government money. So okay. the United States has signed up to for 9% of the $20 billion required to build this facility. How does that compare to how much the other countries are giving? So um, the EU is the largest participant. Makes sense. And then the other countries are all <laughs> split evenly. Okay. So the EU is around 50% and the other ones are all split evenly. Got it. And, but for 9% of the funding for the construction, you have 100% access to the intellectual property. It's amazing. It's it a pretty good deal. It is. <laughs> For the U.S. And, and science experiment of this magnitude, you really want to pool your global resources because if we can get it to work on Earth, that's mm-hmm. a solution. Right. Because of the power density, because of the safety, it's inherently safe, and because it has no waste. So why is it inherently safe? Because if you lose any sort of electricity to power the magnets, mm-hmm. the magnets go dead, the plasma cools off. Hmm. It's a plasma that has to be actively heated. Yeah. And so it just cools off and it's, it dies. It's done. And then no waste? And no waste. Why not? Because it's not, when you think of fission, you think of these heavy elements 
that you're splitting mm -hmm. into fission products. Mm -hmm. And in fact, when we look at the light water reactors of the fleet today, which are thermal, meaning that the neutrons have lower energy level, um, you're only splitting the uranium or you're only doing the cycle once mm -hmm. because we have a non-proliferation treaty yeah. and we cannot reprocess. Mm -hmm. And so we're only using 5% of the of energy, the energy. that's in the fuel, which yeah. means that you have to store the other 95%. Um, mm -hmm. When you look at advanced reactor technologies, like the one that General Atomics is looking into, the energy multiplier module, it's a fast reactor. Mm -hmm. And so because those neutrons are higher in energy, they can split more of the uranium. You just have to be able to remove the fission products periodically. Yeah. So you could use spent nuclear fuel from light water reactors, put them in a fuel form, and use them in EM squared for the fuel. Right. And then you can recycle an EM squared core into the next EM squared. Very cool. Because then you're extracting more and more of the energy out of it instead yeah. of storing it. And because you have fast neutrons, it allows you to do that. Yeah. So it sounds like you're pretty pro-fusion versus fission. No, I, so I honestly, I think you have to get inside the nucleus of the atom. That means fission and fusion. Uh -huh. We need fusion today because we need something that's going to provide electricity until we realize fusion. Yeah. And um, the good thing about ITER is that we reached the 60% construction mark last year. Good. That's it's great. going to start first plasma in 2025. It's going to have deuterium tritium in 2035. These are the isotopes of hydrogen. And so after that point, it's up to each of the nations to come up with what's the next step? Mm -hmm. What's your domestic plan? And the United States is doing that now. They're assembling a Fusion Energy Science Advisory Committee, FESAC committee. Nice. That's Under what department? Department of Energy. Okay. Fusion Energy Science and mm -hmm. the Department of Energy to look at what's the United States' next machine, next facility after ITER. Mm -hmm. And they'll be coming out with a report at the end of 2020. And I really look forward to... At the to end of 2020 for something that is going to happen in 2035. So ITER will happen in 2035. It'll start mm -hmm. really getting into its experiments. Yeah. And so there'll be there'll be years of experiments, feasibility, things that'll be happening on ITER that will help inform the next device that the FESAC committee is going to inform the United States on mm -hmm. because that next device mm -hmm. will be generating electricity. Yeah. Isn't Through that fusion exciting? power. Through fusion power. Yeah. That's extremely exciting. And yeah. that is the holy grail. It's amazing that, you know, we can advance so far on a project that's a global project with, I, to my understanding, fusion hasn't be, been tested as much as fission. We can do that in a quicker timeline than we can, say, save our plants from being decommissioned <laughs> in the U.S. The, <laughs> I think that... And I saw a lot of the energy today at the NEI conference at NIA. Yeah. There are people who are realizing the benefit of these vision plants and who are now coming together and having a conversation of how do we save our fleet. Mm -hmm. And it's not about having one technology in our portfolio. We need a diverse set of technologies, just like your stock portfolio if you want yeah. to hedge risk, you need to have a diverse set of products. And so it's not just fission or fusion or wind or solar. It's all of them. Right. And it's all of them working together. And so, yeah. you know, to the extent that we can develop policy within the United States to grow each one of those sources, the better off we're going to be. Yeah. Especially if you, I, I think one of your main initiatives is clean energy. If you want to meet those clean energy goals mm -hmm. for every new plant that gets shut down a natural gas plant starts up right and these are long-term assets these plants so you lose a lot of money in decommissioning you do yeah and you spend a lot of money to build a new natural gas plant and you and so for a while and you give up on an asset that's been fully the construction costs of these nuclear plants have all been written off at this right. point yeah it's just funding now the operating and the fuel costs required. Yeah. So I have an off script question for you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
it like you know talking about nuclear i always get so impassioned by it and i just want to go out and tell the world like okay we need nuclear power but it's i feel like everybody in the nuclear community is agreeing on these things that we should do and that the government should do that you know go in this direction but it's not really happening that quickly um so like who's who are the right people to convince? And like, if it's people outside of the nuclear community, how do you even reach them and get them to believe in nuclear? I'm really glad you asked that, actually. I yeah. Um, <laughs> because that's part of what I've developed um, initiative for is the nuclear community is really good at talking amongst ourselves, but we're not as good at talking outside of ourselves. Yeah. And because I think of the technical nature of fission and fusion, we leave it up to our technologists to have those discussions. Yeah. And it's not resonating as well as if we really come up with mm -hmm. what's our message? How do we convey our true benefit? How do we get, you know, stakeholders engaged in the conversation so that they can really understand the benefit of this technology and of this resource? And so we're doing a couple of things. Um, NEI is doing a lot of thinking about this. NEI, you'll have to spell Nuclear it out. Nuclear Energy Institute. Uh -huh. And I've been working with them on the Communication Advisory Committee. And so we've been talking about getting foot soldiers out there who are communicators, hmm. not technologists, but yeah. communicators or maybe communicators who understand the technology, but or not down to the enough. point where you, right. <laughs> yeah. Where you know, you know, all of this anyway. So, so getting these sort of foot soldiers out and participating in conversations, well, it's whether it's on a conference or in an interview or what have you, but, yeah. but, Establishing the messaging so that we know that it will, you know, it'll hit the mark. Right. Because there's a literacy issue in a sense of understanding these technologies. And because I think some people hear about them, they automatically think, oh, it's too hard and too complicated. Right. And so trying to get past or that it's barrier. Scary just because it's so difficult and complicated. Right. Right. Yeah. And. So that's part of it. The other part is, um, and so now we're doing this on the fusion side, where fusion is not generating revenue. Hmm. So the fission side has a little better, uh, they have revenue generation, they have some funds that are going toward trying to message for that. So they have the resources yeah. more so than fusion. Fusion doesn't generate revenue. And it's mostly government funded, uh -huh. although right now you'll see a lot of these uh, startups that are privately funded, which I think is fantastic. Like General Atomics? Like So General Atomics gets all of our funding through Department of Energy. Oh, okay. But there are other companies out there like TAE, mm -hmm. Commonwealth Fusion, General Fusion, that they're privately funded through yeah. private investors. And so from my perspective... Any uh, move forward in technology development is positive for everyone. Right. Right? Because you can learn from each other. You can learn. And our goal at the end of the day is to get fusion to work. Yeah. <laughs> and so what we're trying to do is now establish a fusion communicators council, mm -hmm. knowing that resources are going to be very limited but at least getting the communicators together from all of these um, sort of disparate entities that are popping up within the United States mm -hmm. so that we can collaborate and we can talk and we can bring the message up to a level where we understand everyone's technology is good. Right. But how, how far up can we go where we can now agree on our message so that we can really start generating interest mm -hmm. and momentum behind and fusion energy yeah. and more financing. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, it's a big task. So it it's a little bit daunting. Yeah, that leads me into my final question for you. Um, what do you hope for the future of nuclear and how do you think we will get there? I would love to see the United States shift our strategy on funding advanced reactor technologies so that we are selecting at least two because you always need a backup just like when Rick over had to, yeah. but selecting at least two 
And then generating the national strategy around how do we test those materials? How do we test the fuel? How do we really move those forward? That's part. The other part is at the, the state and federal level for the existing plants to start realizing the benefit of these plants and stop the premature closure. Yeah. Because if they keep shutting down, more and more natural, ga natural gas plants are going to pop up and you're de-diversifying the portfolio. Right. That's the other part. And on the DOD side, I would love for, number one, because we need to keep our troops safe. Our troops are out there risking their lives and we should be doing everything we can to make sure that they're safe. And that's a big part of this program of DOD. It's the main incentive of putting out, making sure that there's a resilient energy source that's going to be there when they need it to be. And so that aspect of the DOD program, as well as making sure that we can get some sort of domestic manufacturing, domestic industry restarted and reinvigorated within the United States so mm -hmm. that as young people start looking at where they want to go and what professions they want to be in, that it's attracting that talent and that they're energized and they want to be working in those fields. Yeah. Sabrina, thank you so much. Thank you.